approaching you with uh, a aggravation and a weapon. Okay? That doesn't even make the nightly news. But it might be an unnecessary shooting. Can you feel me? Low racism, high macho, slow trap. So for those of you who want to see the data, this is what it looks like in terms of across, because I just showed you them responding to a particular black suspect. This is our high masculinity threat, low masculinity threat. Folks for whites, this is just people getting shot for Latinos and for blacks. <clears throat> Again, it's not just that the macho officers are more likely to get in bar fights, more likely to be aggressive, which they are. It's that there's a racial disparity to it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here's the take home for that one. If we're looking for racist officers, we're looking for racists, we bench the first guy and we miss the second one. And that seems to me to be a problem, because the reason why I care about racism, I would like for fewer bad things to happen to black and brown people. And it turns out, yeah, it turns out that the best way to do that is not always to just say, you're a racist, go away, right? Some of my best friends are racists, right? especially that first cop. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, here's the deal. How does this relate to schools? Well, it turns out we work a lot with schools, we work a lot with, with school resource officers, school police departments, and police departments that also end up going to schools, okay? The first thing is about officer deployment. In most departments, especially major city departments, officers have some say in where they go. The better you do in the academy, the more likely you are to go where you want. If you've done well at your last uh, assignment, you can go to where you want, especially if you're well liked by the promotion staff. So where do high masculinity threat officers want to go? They want to go to high action neighborhoods. By the way, action is code for black and Latino. So crime attracts macho. By the way, crime also attracts dehumanizing officers. So if you live in a high crime neighborhood, the officers in your neighborhood are more likely to have masculinity threat, more likely to be dehumanizing. All right. <clears throat> As if the realities at home weren't enough in these communities, now on top of that, they get special police officers just for them. Okay. <clears throat> now let's flip the script. Now let's turn around, let's talk about particularly our adolescent, particularly our adolescent men, young men. All right. <clears throat> when is manhood most precarious? When is the secure masculine identity, I know what kind of man I am, most precarious? You see 60 and 70 year old men walking around being like, I can prove to you I'm a man? No, that does not happen all that often. Okay, <clears throat> my dad does it only on Saturdays. <clears throat> it happens as you are becoming a man. It happens most during adolescence, when at home you be, may be asked to be a man of the house, and at school you are taught to be an obedient child. Okay, officers, by the way, are taught, hey, heads up, <clears throat> you need to control the situation. If anybody thinks that they might be in charge, that they can run things, you are not safe. That is, by the way, in many ways, good officer safety practice. But if you can't be in charge of your own outcomes, good luck feeling good as a man in normative masculine concepts, right? We can interrogate gender a lot. I'm happy to do that. So understand I'm, I'm being simplistic because I'm a scientist and that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> but that creates a tension. So I am, as I used to be, adolescent black man. I'm being told, you are not in control of your own outcomes. I haven't done anything. What's my natural response? The hell, I'm not in control of my own outcomes. And now we have a problem. Because officers need to assert control. And adolescent men particularly, particularly feel the need to assert control. And now we have a problem, OK? Adolescents are in both worlds. And that's officers, oh, often what happens when officers fight teenagers. So this is some research we've been doing with young uh, black and Latino men, um, <clears throat> 302 of them. There are juniors that we have followed for two years, so we got some longitudinal data. It was brand new, hot off the presses. Um, <clears throat> and we're looking at police contact. Because again, that contact is, I have to control you to feel safe. Because if you think you can take me, one of us is going home hurt as an officer. But what that means is I have to take from you your authority. That's why we get the alpha cop at the beginning of that traffic stop, and they're have a nice day at the end. They're not like, hey, how you doing at the beginning of the stop? That's never happened to any of you ever. Okay. <clears throat> and what would we expect? So I am striving to attain manhood, a secure sense of that. 
How would chronic contact with law enforcement affect that? So <clears throat> what we were looking for is both in school PDs and municipal PDs, we measured quality of contact, whether or not the contact is good. And what we were t testing is our theory that the more contact you have with police, regardless of what you were doing when you were younger, the more likely you are to be in engaged in criminal activity later. How does that work? If I can't assert my manhood in one condition, if I can't assert my control over a situation in one condition, I'm gonna go do it over here. And by the way, criminal engagement is a popular way for young men to assert their sense of control. All right, <clears throat> so we have chronic contact with police, criminal behavior, and masculinity threat. This is the, first, this is the only kind of statsy thing that I'm gonna show for you. It's just for folks who do mediation modeling, I wanna show that, that we know how to do that kind of stuff. Essentially what happens is, the more contact I have with police when I'm young, the more criminal behavior I'm involved in when I get older, controlling for how much criminal behavior I was ever involved in. So this is regardless of whether or not I was involved in crimes when I was a kid, when I was younger. Regardless of whether or not my family is involved in crimes. Regardless of any of that, just more contact leads to more criminal involvement. By the way, it leads to more masculinity threat, and that's really the thing that's driving that. That manhood threat. That's really what's driving it. So let's, let's recap just real quickly. What's going on is I've got the macho officers and the dehumanizing officers. I want to go into the, the, the action neighborhoods. Those kids in those neighborhoods are even more motivated to show you how much of a man I am, the young, young men in, that, in those neighborhoods. <clears throat> and so you have more contact, which leads to an aggravated threat, which leads to more crime, which leads to the justification for what? More police officers in those same neighborhoods. It's a lovely circle. So what does it mean? Increased police contact, creates criminality, which means we got to factor that into the ecology of masculinity. we got to factor that, that masculinity threat into our understanding of adolescent vulnerability generally. We just have to. And by the way, I mostly study cops, okay? But all the things I'm talking to you about here, they're human psychological universals. So it probably relates to teachers and admins too. Okay. I don't study that because, for instance, in Houston, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, they've let me go into the police departments. The teachers have not invited me in. <clears throat> so the why should I care question, this is the question that I get whenever I'm trying to tell my parents about this kind of stuff, why should I care? Um, <clears throat> Why care about these different kinds of biases? Aren't you just saying racism is a many splendored thing and there's all kinds of racism and it's racist in the world of racism? No. <clears throat> you can only manage a problem that you can measure and different forms of psychological human, human universals are responsible for specific outcomes. Dehumanization is different than prejudice. Implicit bias is different than explicit bias. And these are things that we can train. These are things that we can, <clears throat> we can select officers based on this, or at least we're trying to. Also, we can create policies that limit the likelihood that you're gonna say yoke <clears throat> in response to the question. So understanding the specific mechanisms helps us to design interventions, okay? So my grand summary, before I go ahead and take questions, and am I really short on time? Look at that. Um, <clears throat> Inequality is often not the product of intent, okay? By the way, that helps in conversations, too. Someone did something that you're like, that is the most racist, I cannot, why did you say all that about the watermelons and the fried chicken? I cannot believe that that happened, okay? <clears throat> it's very easy to run up on them and just say, yeah, you're racist. Inequality and discrimination, which is what I, I would argue we should be most concerned with, it's often not the product of intent but we still need a morally compelling language for it. The reason why it's so easy to call somebody a racist is because that requires action. You can't be like, oh, you're so racist. Let's go have lunch. No, that doesn't happen. It's compelling, and we don't yet have a compelling language for it. I would argue that identity traps might be able to become that. Like, not only does someone, is someone habitually falling into a trap so-and-so, but managers set traps for subordinates. Situations set traps for people. <clears throat> so I'm saying traps may help with that. So with that, let me go ahead and, and go ahead and get to questions and say thank you very much for the time. <clears throat> Let's see. I don't know exactly how much time we've got for questions, but I, I understand there's going to be mics here. 
I will, I'll mostly just point, though, and if you guys can be loud, I won't mind. So go ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Sarah, and um, in addition to teaching ESL, um, I work, I co-coordinate the GSA at my school, the Gay Straight Alliance, and I also work with youth, or youth organizing around wellness for LGBTQA youth and uh, their communities. So I'm really interested in this idea of macho as being in charge of outcomes, and I was also interested in the fact that the, f the, the guy who was threatening the police officer with the stick was macho or masculine of centered or cis male. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious about what you think about the idea of queer young folks um, I guess threatening how a person could be in charge of their outcomes. You know, I have a student f starting in the ninth grade, he's now an organizer, but he would walk in and the safety agent would call him a faggot when he walked in in the morning. And to me, that's a self-defense mechanism on the part of the safety agent. So I'm curious what you think about the idea of a queer individual presenting that sort of challenge to a um, macho person. I'm, I'm smiling, because not that I'm terribly surprised, but just every time they make it so obvious, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take that, put it in my bag, thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's, that's insane. Um, so as, as, I, as I commented, we started looking at this masculinity threat um, and gender normativity sort of more broadly because there was one jurisdiction, it's a major city, hmm. where over 70% of the officer-involved shootings began with a sexual orientation threat to male officers. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, it, you don't just challenge because you're macho versus macho, right? There are other ways to challenge by impugning someone's normative masculinity. Yeah. So absolutely, a thousand percent, um, we do a, a lot of work actually on, on th that particular construction. Basically, I would just echo and say amen, and that's exactly correct. That's another route to get to. Thanks. Okay, that one's empty, so go ahead. Dr. Phil, you're... Um... Really? <laughs> really? Okay, okay. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, it's fine, it's fine. Your presentation was really an eye-opener as a, a, a male in a middle school. Um, and I'm sure you've made recommendations to the police forces that you have um, shared this information to in the research uh, topics. What would you recommend for us as teachers that fall into those same traps? So it usually helps, it frequently helps to be able to have a space to stop and think. Okay, not stop and frisk, stop and think. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that we recommended in some of the schools that have invited us in is a waiting period before referral. Okay. So in, you know, in zero tolerance policies are all the rage everywhere because public safety, we need to keep kids safe to educate them. You know, uh, there was recently a report that came out from the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Center for Civil Rights, it's out of the UCLA Center, but it's actually out of Vermont. Regardless, what it's, what it's finding is that over 90% of the referrals are for things not covered in zero tolerance in those zero tolerance um, jurisdictions. So what that means is it's, it's frequently teacher discretion. So if the teachers can cool off and let the kids cool off and then decide, is this something for which I should deprive a child of an education, that's going to help. It's going to help tremendously. Because usually the reason why there's such a quick referral is someone is, is, is concerned about loss of life or property or physical harm. So just stop it. Take a second. Put them in a corner. Put them in a chair. Tell them to just be quiet for a couple of seconds. If you, can, if you can manage to do that, it helps tremendously. Right? Also, allowing kids to have a space where they can choose to do that themselves. Right? So we work a lot with um, uh, <clears throat> gang refer referral and gang diversion programs. And it turns out it helps a lot. If a kid thinks that they're about to get into a fight, right, you have a space where it's a no fighting zone. They can just walk and go there. So instead of, well, I have, no, I have no options, I'm sitting in the hallway, I have no options, you just said this thing to me and everybody heard, I'd be like, you know, mm, I'm gonna go over here. And it turns out that if you give enough strokes to folks for doing that, it can help reduce the violence problem in the school. Because nobody wants to be in a fight, even if you think you're gonna win, you don't want to be in that fight. Right? You would like to have other alternatives. Those are two of the things. There's, I mean, the, it really matters how the school is set up. We give policy recommendations. We give training recommendations. But stop and think and giving other alternatives are two of the biggest ones. If that Thanks. helps. Thank you. Okay. See over here. So thank you for being so entertaining as you unpack uh, you. quite a bit of information. Uh, the question I had is, so you pretty much diagram the dynamic between white and black. Um, and I don't want to miss out on the fact that, having done some of the research, that black students are suspended equally as much by black folk as well 
And could you talk just a little bit about the dynamics by which we as black and African American and Latinos are equally a victim of that sense of dehumanization and the racism that the larger systems have kind of, you know, read us by? Okay. Well, thank you for that question, and that gives me an opportunity to clarify. What I showed you are human psychological universals, right? It, it fits neatly, or more neatly, into a black-white paradigm. And by the way, I, I don't just deal with black and white. It's just there's a lot of research on that, and this is stuff that translates very easily. Um, but black officers were doing this, too. Just the black officers didn't consent to me videotaping them. I guess they, they knew they were, what they were about to do. Um, <clears throat> so it's not the case that what I showed you is a, is a black-white only. Right? It's black officers, Latino officers, Asian officers. And by the way, it's straight officers, queer identified officers. There are advantages for having a diverse and representative police force. It's just they don't show up in this. So it's disappointing. We, we almost assume, well, no black person is asso associating black people with AIDS, except sometimes they do. Right? And it's not that, well, it's the bad black people that are on this. Mm -mm. We had it with black college undergraduates at some of the most prestigious institutions in the world do the same thing, right? Implicit bias is not, I don't like you. Implicit bias is, I'm paying attention. These associations, are, they're activated because they become automatic. We see them. We take them in all the time, right? So I ask this question of, of folks. If I am seeing black people, and it is the news, and it is the last 10 minutes of the news, what am I watching? I said, the, the crime segment. I mean, in LA, I'm watching the, the crime segment, right? I don't even have to really be watching. I'm usually grading papers or writing papers, and the news is on, and I'm like, blah, 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 and I hear the, a, a black accent in my ear. I'm like, oh, the crime section's on. You just take that in. I'm just paying attention, right? And we have a sense. That's why we keep kids away from certain things. We want to keep them away from certain video games. We want to keep them away from certain things on the internet, because we have a sense it will influence us. By the way, it doesn't stop when you're a kid. You learn this throughout your life. You would develop these sets of associations, and they impact your behavior, especially in moments when we don't have time to think. So it is black, white, Latino, everybody that I'm out outlining with this. I wish it were different, but it's not. Um, I saw that you, like, about the part where the um, masculinity threat, I was wondering if you did any research on, like, aggression related to um, Females having like a problem with the male dominance thing coming from police officers. So like I just wanted to know if there was like any research on like how that's connected. Um, you couldn't see it, but the reason why there was a, a slight giggle is because you asked a question for you and the question behind you. So, <laughs> but say, so, oh. so that that was that was two good questions. Well done. Um, <clears throat> so I like getting a chance to, to talk a, a little bit more sophisticatedly about. Uh, uh, gender and the way it plays out in this. We do have some research on this. So of, uh, you saw of the, I think it was 63 in that study, 57 of the officers were men. Well, there, that means that there were six women in there. What do they act like? Well, we've done these studies all over the country, and it turns out that women are not that concerned about their manhood. Turns out. <laughs> Could have gone either way, but it turns out they're not that concerned about it, unless they're under five foot two. I'm not saying that women under five foot two are suddenly masculine. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, my girlfriend would be very upset with me. Um, <clears throat> it turns out, though, that there's a need to assert a kind of aggression that looks very masculine gender typed if you are diminutive in size. Right? <clears throat> and so if you've ever gone on a ride along, and I encourage you to do this, it's, you get to ride in the front seat of the car, which is a better place to be than in the back seat. But you ride along with an officer. I have the occasion to ride along with a lot of, of women police officers, and the women police officers on the first stop, almost invariably, they, they show up to the door, and some man opens the door and says, who ordered the stripper? <laughs> now, it's funny until you recognize that that's their life. That's their reality every day at their job. If you showed up to your job every day and someone said, who ordered the stripper, that would stop being funny really fast. You have to assert a different kind of control over the situation. Right? So that's, that's one component of it, is that women, if you want to make uh, less violence in a police force, hire more women, especially tall women. But that was not fully your question. Well, your yeah, I meant like for the, on the opposite end. On the opposite end, what we find is that women over uh, the course of a lifetime, especially as they get older, have really good ways of de-escalating situations with men. 
because they've had practice doing it, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so uh, regardless of sexual orientation, women have encountered lots of men, and they've dealt with their stupidity for years and years, and they usually find good ways of de-escalating. What you do find, particularly among uh, queer-identified women, though, is you do find that there is a sense of, I need to be in control of my physical space and my bodily space. Right? in a different way as a result of negotiating a queer identity in a world that has hated queer bodies. Right? So what we do find in, <clears throat> in trans communities and in queer identified communities is that everybody responds negatively to the macho officer. And it does tend to escalate, particularly in queer communities. I, the data are not that great about it because it's hard to get folks in queer communities to answer these kinds of questions. We say, hey, we're doing research on the police. Hey, where are all you going? I don't understand. Um, but for what limited information we do have, we are seeing exactly the kind of thing that you're thinking we would. Okay. Go ahead. Mm, short. Um, I have a question about, you talked a lot about fast traps and not so much about slow traps, and I was kind of curious about what the, what's the word I'm looking for? Some of the things that happen due to slow traps. So the masculinity threat is, is one thing that I would call a slow trap. Right, so that, <clears throat> I apologize if that's not uh, uh, super clear. The other one that is most common and the biggest problem for us um, is really ironic. Officers that are concerned about being seen themselves as racist are more likely to engage in racially disparate use of force. Because again, I've, I've got to control the situation. If you think you can take me, one of us is going home hurt. So what form of authority do I have to control the situation? Two forms. The first is my moral authority. You do what I say because I'm, well, I'm wearing itchy blue polyester. right? I got this badge on. You do what I say. Okay? If I lose my moral authority, I've only got one form of authority left, which is my physical or coercive authority. So what happens? I'm an officer, and through experience, I know this car full of young African-American men are going to call me racist. Where is my moral authority? I, I, I left it in the car. So anything gets escalated even a little bit, and all the only kind of authority I've got is physical authority. Those are the kinds of slow traps where they take up so much of your brain space, you can't do anything else. So kind of, does that make sense? Yeah. Have I done a decent job that time? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you much. I'm, I'm looking here at time. I don't, I don't have a set. The folks in the back, I think, are trying to, to start me from stopping. So let me take this one last question. I'll try and be brief in my answer. I think we're going to have to wrap up. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about the masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, so do you feel that uh, the, the lack of a masculine feeling in black youth is disproportionate to the youth of other races? And if so, why? OK, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I want to I clarify something. There's a difference between not feeling masculine and feeling the need to prove it all the time. I may feel plenty masculine. And in fact, if you got a question, I'll answer it. I'll show you, OK? <laughs> That's different than, you know, masculinity is not that important to me, OK? <clears throat> and what we find is that need to prove it is higher in black and Latino communities, right? Because of, frankly, a, a disconnect between the expectations of gender roles at home and the expectations of gender roles in school and in work and other places. So what's happening is you have employers of youth and teachers who are expecting really obedient, subsur subservient behavior. And they expect it actually more from blacks and Latinos. They, they require it, I should say, more of blacks and Latinos than they do of whites. But at home, blacks and, black and Latino youth are being asked to be more adult. And that disconnect makes it really hard to manage. By the way, just if you go and you, you watch it, and those of you who work in the homes and between homes and schools, you see it, it's just a hard thing for human beings. So this is not a genetic thing at all. It's not the kind of stuff that I do. Right? This is not a pathology thing. Well, it's, it's part of black culture and you know, since slavery and it's dysfunctional. It's none of that. This is a human thing. Anybody in that situation would feel that way. But we do see the need to prove it more in the communities where you see the larger disconnect. They happen to be disproportionately black and Latino. Thank you, doctor. Okay. All right, I, I, I'm going to have to, to wrap up there because they're giving me signs in the back. So thank you very much. <laughs> but, can we, we're, we'll grab right afterwards. OK, thank you. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Into the steeple. Sorry, I'm sorry.
if he's, he's trying to get I'm sorry. No, I, I can't do anything for him. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Goff. Thank you. I just have a few logistical notes. Everyone, everyone just give a round of applause for Dr. Goff. So just a few logistical notes for everyone. We're going to have a break until 2.15. Uh, and then after that, at 2.15, if you could report to the morning, the same rooms where the morning sessions were held, we're going to be repeating those same sessions. Um, so if you had a second choice that you wanted to go to, now's the time. And then at 3.45, we're going to be meeting back in the community room, which is where you had breakfast, uh, for our final session. We're going to give everyone an opportunity to, to break into small groups and discuss everything you've heard today um, and really get a chance to learn from each other and share what, what we've heard today and what, we've, what you all came in with the experience from your own communities. When you get into that room, you're going to see on the different tables, there'll be cards labeled with different roles, teachers, administrators, students, parents, judges, law enforcement, um, researchers, funders, and advocates. So if you could please find the table with the role that most identifies with you and sit there. And if you don't fit into any of those, there'll be a questions table that we can help uh, get you situated. And we'll be having a dis small group discussions there. So thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you at 2.15. Just move on.